beating to my own drum here. Welcome everyone to another Trust Engine Friday Mastermind. I am Todd Bookspan, the founder of Win by Noon and ironically co-founder of this group. And I'm excited to be here um, as the co-host today um, as we welcome uh, an awesome guest. But before I bring him on, I want to introduce my co-hostess, the most is none other than Deborah Bird, who if you just joined us now, you missed her sync live. What's up with uh, plug and play? Uh, uh, hey, we're staying alive. <laughs> we're thriving, right. staying alive and happy national pizza day. So, what? You know, today's I, I saw that plug and play great yeah. created a great pizza post for me. I am going to be ordering the Kelsey pizza on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Oh my um, but God. that is from Papa John's, but that is the Jason and Kylie Kelsey, not the Travis Kelsey pizza. I'm all still about the, the other Kelsey's. I have not hey, seen you guys. Y'all put in the chat or either on Facebook live or in zoom, who are you rooting for on Sunday? Even if your team's not in it, are you 49ers or Kansas city? Which one? Let us know. I'm i uh, I'm going to throw out my prediction, you know, cause my, and that means it's going to go the other way. So whoever I cheer for always loses. <laughs> Um, except for that one time my Eagles won the Super Bowl and I was there. And I'm going to cheer for Brock Purdy, the local boy here from Arizona, relative of Jeff Zimfer, a member of our community. Uh, I would love to see Brock and the 49ers win with a, a last second field goal from their field goal kicker who's been mediocre the last few games. Yeah, Greg, I, can't root, I can't root for the 49ers. I'm a Hawks fan. So <laughs> it's going to, I'm, right, I'm pulling real quick. Deborah and I will be joining us without a guest. <laughs> I'm rooting for Taylor Swift. Okay. That is Let's hilarious. Ben <laughs> in the right, chat Deborah, said the you same your thing. Prediction and, then, and then we can go, uh, then we can get this call started for real. So I can't go for the 49ers being a Cowboys fan either. Yeah. So I'm going for the Chiefs. You know, I love Let's Andy, Reed, but I think the I think the Chiefs need to lose. Um, you know, they can't, they're dying, they're gonna be around for a long time. We're gonna see a lot of Super Bowl victories from Mahomes. He's amazing. Um, and so um, real quick, uh, we're, we're really not publicly starting to push it out, but Modern Mortgage Summit is going to be the 28th of March. Um, it's going to be virtual and live again, just like it was last year. Um, we've got an amazing list of speakers. If you go to modernmortgagesummit.com, you can actually see all of the mortgage speakers and we'll be rolling out the real estate agent speakers whoa, over the next um, couple of weeks. Um, if you remember the way that we run that event, um, it's designed for you to host real estate agents. The morning um, from eight to noon is going to be the Modern Mortgage Summit. And we have an amazing list of speakers. We brought back all of your favorites and some new speakers. And then we have an hour break for lunch. And then that's where you're going to set it up with your realtors in your conference room. Uh, last year, we had people doing a movie theater. And then we will run from one to three Pacific as the Modern Real Estate Summit. It's a great way, an inexpensive way for you to bring people face to face, team up with a title rep, whoever you, however you want to do it. But it's just a great opportunity um, for you. Um, we'll be selling a 30 day pass. We'll be selling a year long pass, um, as many of you bought in the past. And then we will have a limited number of seats. There's uh, 60 people in Bradley's studio in Las Vegas in leather reclining chairs. You'll be sitting with the speakers watching the event. Um, and we've priced it, we think, appropriately for the market. Last year, we sold those tickets for $2,500. This year, um, we're running and we expect to sell out at 1000 bucks a ticket. Um, and if you do the live event, then I host the live Think Tank Mastermind the next day. Um, it'll be a three-hour mastermind um, that got rave reviews last year from uh, the folks who were there last year, uh, most of our speakers were there too. So it was kind of a cool way for um, people to sit with uh, the people that you all see, know, and love and get to be one-on-one -on -one in small groups with them. Um, just go to modernmortgagesummit.com. Uh, I think the only urgency is around the live tickets because those are the ones I think that'll go fast. It was such a great right. event. It yeah. was fantastic. Yeah. It's a great and event. Even being there live with everybody. And, you know, to your point, <laughs> Todd, that mastermind and the way that you led it, it was I remember Denise and Shayla, they were, they were like, I, can we keep this going? Like, could we do something like this every quarter? Cause it was so powerful to have all of these, you know, power players in one room, just sharing and so giving and coming from abundance to talk about the things that they're working on or what their challenges are. So it was just, it was a pretty special day for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm coming, I'm coming for momentum builder and I might have to, uh, might have to make another trip down to Vegas. So we'll see. There you go. There you go. We should give a plug. Deborah and I'll be on stage at Momentum Builder, and we're we're super stoked uh, for that event um, as well. They're just two different types of events. Um, I think both will be great, and I think we will see a lot of people 
um, show up at, at both. So without further ado, though, we should uh, bring on Greg Anderson. He's been talking about his Seahawks. Don't hold that against him. Um, <laughs> you know, there are a few nice Seahawks fans out there, and, and I do know them. And uh, then there's the rest. Um, but I'm I'm really excited. We've had Greg. He's been a great friend of of the Trust Engine channel. He's done some great interviews, including one where he was with uh, with none other than Deborah's sister. Um, I like that. See, everyone says you know Jason Kelsey's brother. You know, we'll just call her Deborah's sister, um, the nerd. And um, and you know, Greg sets a unique role. He's in uh, Washington. He's a, a producing branch manager with a team, and so he comes with the perspective of someone who's actually out there in the market doing loans. Um, as well as leading others who are doing loans as well. So welcome, Greg. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you guys. Good to be back. You know, it is. And so we frame this of um, how to help realtors adapt to the changing market. So um, why yeah. don't you kind of kick it off of why that's the title you chose and kind of head us in the, the right direction here? Yeah, so actually, I want to start with myself. Uh, I've been in the business for almost 20 years. Uh, and I will tell you, last year was brutal for me personally. And I, the reason I bring this up is not because it's about me, but because I think transparency and sharing your pain is super, super important right now. Right. I know for me, I've been for many, many years around hundred million, of course, during pandemic years, it was a lot more than that, but you know, let's say a hundred million dollar producer. Uh, I closed 44 million last year. That's a big drop. And I don't take losing very well, just like a lot of us in our industry, a lot of us in our in our community, right? If you're spending the time to be on the trust engine community, you're probably one of those people that's always trying to sharpen your sword. You're always trying to get better. And so when all of a sudden you see a massive drop of your business, that can be really, really hard. So what I've really done a lot recently is share my own story and share my own pain with my realtors. Because we have realtors. I, I have a realtor recently that told me that she on the side is doing Uber Eats. And this is a realtor that made a really, really nice living in real estate and has been for a long time. But right now to make ends meet, she's having to do Uber Eats, right? So I look at that and I think, okay, maybe my problem isn't as big as, a, as, as some of these other people. I got to figure out a way to help them, right? The cool yeah, thing about, yeah, and, and the cool thing about this market is that, you know, there's, we're going to see rates come down. If you watch Brian Hale's video, I watched it last night. It's a great one. Um, I encourage everybody to go watch that. You know, he, he kind of warns everybody, let's not put a date on this, right? Let's not, let's not do the May 10th thing again uh, because we don't know when rates are kind of going to come down. Everybody's anticipating it. Maybe it'll be later this year. Maybe it'll be next year. We really don't know. And things are changing every single day. So if you think of it from a realtor's perspective, they're leaning on us. They're leaning on their mortgage professionals to let them know what's happening in the market, right? What I'm seeing, and especially when rates started ticking down here in November and December, and we got down kind of into the mid sixes, is all of a sudden realtors were just blowing up social media about, look, rates are coming down, time to buy, time to buy. That's great. We want to put that message out there, but we also need to prepare our real estate partners for the roller coaster ride that we are on and that we're going to be on probably for a lot of this year. You know, we don't want them seeing that mortgage news daily report that comes out that says rates tick back above seven and then they get discouraged and then they go sit in a corner. Or they start thinking about like, oh, I got to get a second job. We don't want that for our partners. Right. We want to keep them going. So we have to arm them with that information. Number one, what rates are, but why they are where they are. Because I think the why behind it will help people understand that now could be a great time to buy, right? Now could be a great time to sell. We don't have a lot of inventory up in the Seattle market. Our inventory is at all-time lows, right? It's hard to get into a home as a buyer up here. So we need to help people understand why it's a great time to buy. 
And it can't just be the anecdotal. Well, you know, real estate is, as you know, has always gone up. Well, that that's a fact. But why is right now a great time to buy? And I yeah, think I would love your script on that because I find that yeah. realtors and mortgage lenders, I've been in this business for over 20 years and I've never heard any of them say that today wasn't a good time to buy. Sure. And so I love that script because it sounds like you're using data and knowledge. So walk us through that conversation. Yeah. So it really just comes down to looking at, and I, and I uh, associate it with any asset, right? So I tell people, hey, don't you wish you would have bought Amazon stock five years ago? Don't you wish you would have bought Amazon stock 10 years ago or Apple stock or Microsoft stock or something like that? You know, don't you really wish you would have bought it in 2008 when everything crashed or at the beginning of the pandemic when everything crashed and everybody was selling? Don't you wish you would have bought at that point in time? And everybody knows that because not everybody owns a home currently, but everybody understands the power of being able to buy a stock when it was down, right? When everybody else was selling. Well, it's the same thing that's going on with housing right now. People are not jumping in and buying. It depends on the market because ours is ours is still hot. But in, in a lot of places, people are not buying. You can go in, you can negotiate a better price. You can negotiate a 2-1 buy down. You can negotiate, have everything covered. Right. If you're going in with a builder, you can get nicer countertops and maybe a pool in the backyard. You can get a lot right now. And people don't understand why that is. Well, it's because rates are higher. And we know that for every 1% increase or drop in rates, it either removes 5 million potential buyers or adds 5 million potential buyers. So if you remove 5 million buyers when rates went up to 8%, like you would literally ask for anything and you probably would get it. And we were seeing that. But those rates came down 1%. Now we're seeing in our market multiple offers in some cases, right? I mean, I had a client last weekend, they made an offer on a, a pretty hot neighborhood for the tech industry. Um, they went 100,000 over asking and they weren't even in the running. It, that house went 300,000 over the asking price and rates are still around 7%. So wow. if you are sitting out there and you think, oh, you know, this, this housing market's going to crash. Uh, unfortunately, I think you're going to be wrong. It's going to, you're going to be the same person that said, I can't buy Amazon stock because it's going down or I can't buy Amazon stock because, you know, it's not, you know, going up. Right. So how do you teach that to your partners or to the consumer where they don't look at you as a salesperson because they could think, right. well, of course you say that, like yeah. you benefit if we buy homes. Are there things that you're doing to help agents grasp this? Like, is there certain data that you study? Like, how do you teach this? Well, I mean, you know, I'll give Barry a plug. I do use MBS Highway. He's got some great slides. Um where it basically just shows like over a 30, 40 year period. Here's what's happened with real estate, right? The one I use a lot is don't bet, don't bet against the champion. Uh, I think there's some other people in here. I think, I think Denise uses that one too, but it basically shows that over a, a 40 year period, you can see only tiny little windows where home prices actually dipped. And those are the windows where if people bought they had the biggest upside, right? So I think, I mean, yes, you're right. We sometimes come across as very salesy because that's our job is to sell homes, right? But at the same time, I think it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you are trying to lead somebody to where they where they should go, right? Then you're going to have to kind of sell them on the idea of whatever it is. If you're a financial advisor, you might be selling your client on the idea of having a, a, an appropriate life insurance policy and having the right mix of your stocks to bonds and all that stuff, right? You're still having to lead that client where they go or where they need to go. So that's kind of how I approach it. I use data and use those charts and um, kind of my, my shtick, I guess. 
No, I, I think that's great. And I think it's so important to use the charts and the data because it it gives validity to the words that you say. And that's that's what I was hoping you would say. I wasn't sure if you were going to say that, um, which is why I think one one action item that I think everyone who's listening could could take away right now is, do you have access to these charts or graphics easily at your fingertips that if you're doing a Zoom with a client or if you're going in to meet with an agent or even host a class for agents, that you could pull these up on a slide deck when you need them. That way you are giving more depth to the words that you say because it is so important, even with the videos that you guys are putting on social media. Sometimes the talking head videos isn't enough. We need to have that third-party data come in and just anchor in the words that we're saying. And it also helps visually tell the story. So um, I'm glad glad you said that. And you know, takeaway number one, guys, is have those easily available on your desktop, on a slideshow, something. Um, and, and start incorporating them in your meetings. For sure. For sure. Now, Greg, are you doing one to many? Like, do you do classes every month? How are you prospecting agents and then getting in front of them consistently? Yeah, we know, so, I think the data shows you, we need way more partners than we ever needed before. Yeah. But then it's like, mm -hmm. how in the world do you incubate and nurture all of these partners when you mm -hmm. have so many, you know? So what's your, it's, what's it's your hard. tips on that? It's hard. I mean, I think, you know, over the years, I've probably, um, you know, gone between maybe 100 to 200 real estate agents that I'm marketing to and and working with and, and that. So um, it's hard to have a relationship with 200 people. I have a heck of a time having a relationship with just my family, right? So, um, so that that's really difficult. But I think by putting out social media content by, I do a, a weekly update about the market. So a video that goes out um, via text to all those partners that have signed up and they want that. Uh, try to keep things on my face, on my Facebook page and, and Instagram page so that there's things that people can see like what I'm talking about. So that, that's kind of the one to many. I do speak at a couple of real estate offices, um, you know, on a weekly basis. And then I also do trainings. So I don't do them every month, but I would like to do more. So that's kind of the goal is for, for me is to teach more classes um, on just, you know, whatever's going on in the market or different loan programs, that type of thing. I think when you do that, that creates the uh, the idea of, hey, you know, this is somebody that can maybe speak if they can speak to me and help me understand the market or, or this loan program, then they're going to be great for my clients, right? So the, the days of being able to just use a tool like Mortgage Coach Edge, right? Um, the people that were using that tool five years ago were probably kind of the cream of the crop of the loan officers, right? Well, now everybody is doing that. That's just the nature of progress, right? I, I, I see, I get people that are shopping me against other lenders and they send me their TCAs now. Right. So, so I'm, I'm working on, okay, well, if everybody's going to use this tool now, how can I use it better? Right. How can I be a little bit different? One thing that I do is I do a video on all of my TCAs. They all get a video. I don't think a lot of people are doing that yet. I think there's people that are, but there's not a ton. Um, I've actually started to shoot the videos outside of the TCA on my phone, go in, add captions to it, and then upload it through the, the mobile app, right? So now it's a little bit more... Uh, higher quality video. It's got captions at the bottom for people that don't want to turn on the sound, you know, like, so just trying to think of different ways to be a little bit better with the tools we have. Right. Now, have you heard of lender marketing platform it used to be called lender launchpad? Have you heard of it? I, you know, Scott, Scott's a friend. Yes. <laughs> um, I have, I'm not, I have not signed up for it. I signed up for it. Uh, I, I was one of those people that I signed up for everything that all my friends were pitching. Uh -huh. um, and I just realized when business went down, like, oh my gosh, I signed up for this and I was paying it every month and I didn't use it. So I turned everything off 
um, <laughs> except for except for Mortgage Coach and except for MBS Highway. I literally turned everything off. And I didn't, the only thing I'm turning back on is as I go use it. So yeah. I turned off my bomb bomb. Wow. And I probably saved three months worth of bomb bomb subscription because I didn't use it. It was, it was three or four months later that I actually turned it back on because I needed it. Right. So a little pro tip on finances, because, <laughs> Hey, we all know, like, we're so blessed in this industry. We can make so much money, way more money that for me than I'm qualified to make. Um, you know, and so you just end up signing up for things and spending money here and there. And then you realize uh, when things kind of take a, t a dip down that, wow, I'm wasting all this money, you know, right. paying for coaching programs that I'm not actually doing anything like, you know, all that stuff. So I just shut it all off and I'm starting over and uh, feels feels good to only use what I use. But to your point, Lender Launchpad is a great uh, program and Scott's great. And you're, you're part of that now too. I am. I show up on Wednesdays and they, they let me be the redheaded stepchild, so to speak. I feel bad saying that since Dave's kind of a redhead, but, <laughs> um, and I did want to throw out and Todd, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. But for those of you who want a free app to get the captions on your videos. Okay. So this doesn't cost you anything, but if you download the app, it's literally <laughs> called captions. That's what I use. Is that, is that what you use? It's very I use that or cap cut. Yeah. Very easy to use guys and it's free. So I know, you know, some people it's still kind of a, a lean pipeline out there and it can really add that extra oomph to your videos that you're already recording on your phone. And to Greg's point, most videos, people don't always have the volume turned up. So you really need to have the captions so that people can read if they want to read. And sometimes they read and listen. So, um, and I know we're a little bit over just a quarter of the call. And so Todd, I'll let, I'll let you lead with the next question since I've been kind of hogging right. Greg yeah, to myself we're one, here. We're one third, if we're going to use our fractions, you know, miss school teacher. Oh, <laughs> I think it was, Todd. I think it was really interesting. So I, I love the financial piece and, you know, you talk about this. I mean, anyone who's been in any of my coaching groups over the last couple of years, I mean, I started talking early on about, you know, trimming the fat and, um, and, and I think that that's really important. You mentioned, uh, top realtor driving Uber Eats. Um, I mentioned a couple of times I had a realtor who's been in the business for 20 years, um, broker with a small shop. Um, she took a full-time job. Uh, and I was like, well, gosh, if you just actually make those calls to your database, maybe then mm -hmm. you don't have to take a job. Um, I talked to another agent who was driving Instacart and you know, doing that to get his credit card bill paid down so that he could turn on his dialer so he could generate more leads before his closing the following week. And it's a right. it's a tough. Uh, time out there. How are you having those conversations with, you know, with those realtors who are saying that and maybe even loan officers as well who are struggling? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a tough thing because when you get to that point, if you're a realtor, a loan officer, and you've been in the business a while and, and had a lot of success, it's, it's a tough point when somebody makes that choice to go get another job, right. Or go, you know, drive kind of a, a part-time job or something like that. And, and I never want to, I never want to make somebody feel bad for having to make that decision. Um, but if we're being honest, what to your point of just like we coach people about, hey, if you're renting, you're paying somebody else's mortgage. Well, if you are making the choice to go work for somebody else and work for another company, then yeah, but you're paying, you know, you're paying their mortgage now, right? So it's, do you pour in those hours to your own business or do you pour them into somebody else's business, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a tough thing and it's a personal thing. I mean, look, real estate and mortgage both can be very, very emotionally draining businesses, right? If you think about your a real estate agent in your local community and all of a sudden you drive by your past client's home and there's a sign in the yard with somebody else's name on it or you know your your best friend or your your sister decided to list their home with somebody else and sometimes that can just take a toll an emotional toll on people when that stuff happens and so some people just make the, the they just vote and say you know what now that the finances aren't working out either like I, i'm out I'm going to go work for a, a company and that's totally fine. That's, that, that's just part of the nature of any business. But I do think for those people that say, I really want to be in, in real estate, 
and but I'm going to go over here and work this other job. I think to what you said about your partner there, Todd, was that's that's actually not bad. If your goal is to go make some extra money, however you have to do it, to pay down your credit card so you can get your business back going, I would say that's probably better than just giving up and, you know, going to work for somebody else. Yeah, I love that. I love the tenacity of it. You know, I think it's, um, you know, I even uh, talked to loan officers who sold their house to have enough cash to get through, yeah. you know, through this next, through this next bit. So let's, let's steer back towards realtors. And I know that you- Can I just add one, there. one thing real quick, Todd? Yeah, Sorry, absolutely. real quick. I actually, I had met with an agent who said they started to do Uber driving and it was like the best thing they could have done for their business because they were taking people on trips to and from the airport and it would- create quality conversations with these people. And they would find out that they were flying there to start looking around and decide, mm -hmm. you know, which neighborhoods would we want to be in? And some of them hadn't even contacted an agent yet. So I thought, wow, what an interesting way to get some quality conversations in by being an Uber driver. So right. anyways. Love it. Hey, real quick, Deborah, we're getting a couple of questions on the captions app. Someone said they downloaded it and it's $10 a month, not free. What, what are we missing here? Oh, mine was free. Was yours free, Greg? I think mine was free. Yeah, I downloaded it a couple of years ago, though. So right, well, maybe they're maybe they're charging now. Free captions app, but if anyone <laughs> else has any other, you could also download the app Cap, like C A P Cut C U T. Yep. It's a little bit more. It's a great free video editing tool. It does allow you to add captions. Um, it's usually what I recommend for those who are starting out of trying to learn video editing. Um, so you can try that one. That one I know is free and they have a desktop version and a mobile app. So you could look at CapCut. Yeah. The only thing you have to do on that one is, is you have to make sure that you don't use a feature that is not free because then it won't let you export it to your phone. It'll let you use it. But then when you try to export it to your phone, it won't work. So I use that like daily. Yes. Um. Yeah. So, you know, I think what one of the things I don't know, I, I wanted to touch on this today because I think it's what's really important is our realtors are having to sell for the first time in some of their cases in ever. Right. So think about this. If I was a buyer's agent um, in the past, and I've actually had agents that have been in the business 20 years and they're freaking out right now. Because in the past, I was able to say, oh, you get you get me and all my expertise for free because the seller pays the commission. The seller pays me. So it's all free. Well, we have seen multi-million dollar lawsuits or multi-billion dollar lawsuits that ended up being settled for multi-millions of dollars against Keller Williams, Remax, like you name it. Everybody's getting sued. Okay. Well, they're getting sued because people were saying that, oh, you don't even have to pay for me, right? Which wasn't true. It was never true. You were paying for that in a higher price in the home or some in some fashion, right? So now we, we always have had to sell because for our clients, they get a sheet that lists, you know, 18 different line items that they have to pay for. So we have had to sell our value and what they're paying for, for years. That's been our thing. So we need to help our partners in that regard, right? And I think like in our market, um, there's there's a, a new MLS rule that basically says, if you don't have a signed buyer agency agreement that says they understand how much they're paying you, before you show them houses, before you do any real estate activities, then you potentially may not get a commission on that transaction. OK, so that's all now started at the beginning of the year. So we're we're a, a month and a half in and we're seeing how that's going. But there's a lot of people that are freaking out. I use I, I made a TCA and I can share it, um, but I made a TCA that basically addresses this. And um, you guys want me to share? Yeah, That'd be great. Cool. Um, that's not the one. So. <laughs> Sorry. Can you also put the link Back there? in the uh, chat for in case anyone else wants to follow along? Yeah, let me put that. Too. Let me let me do that really quick. Sorry. Paul, can up. you throw the link in there? You keep talking, Greg. We'll have Paul throw the link in for us. Okay, cool. Yeah. So anyway, um, I want to share this. Let me find the right the right buttons here. 
Can I? I get. I don't think I can share. Oh, there I can. Yeah. yeah sorry. Here we go. Right here. It's Greg's first time to be on Zoom. I know. No kidding. Oh, I don't on, know why all this other stuff is coming up. So. Guess. Just kidding. So you, can you see this? Yes. TCA. Yes. Okay. Cool. So the this TCA basically uh, it's a seven hundred thousand dollar house. It's kind of a first time buyer house in our market, and somebody's putting five percent down. So a lot of people are are saying, well, gosh, you know, these buyers don't have the ability to to pay this difference. So if I have an agreement with my buyer that they're going to pay a 3% commission, but the listing agent is only offering a 2.5% commission or 2%, we're even seeing 1% in some cases. Um, now that creates a big problem. So do I just agree to work for this buyer and drive them all around and just accept what the seller uh, is willing to give me, or do I somehow work out what, how they can pay my commission, right? Because if somebody's putting 5% or 3% down, they probably don't have an extra few thousand dollars to throw towards their agent's commission. So what I did is I used a TCA, uh, and you'll see a little video down here with captions, um, to explain what we're looking at, right? So we're looking at in that first column, we're seeing a 3% commission. So you'll see there's really no difference, but to compare, you'll see in the second column, it's a two and a half percent commission. So all we're doing is we're rolling out on top of the price. So this is a negotiation for these agents, which they've been, they've been able to negotiate closing costs and things like that. So it makes their job a little easier. Um, and then you basically say, Hey, look, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, you know, this, there's a two and a half percent commission on this one. So per our agreement, uh, you're going to pay me 3%. So the difference is 3,500. So we're going to get the seller to pay that to up their commission, but we're going to have to add that on top of the sales price. So now instead of 700, it's 703, 500. Well, you can see their payment goes up by about $25 a month and their uh, cash to close goes up by a couple hundred dollars. So most people are going to say, gosh, rather than pay 3,500, I would probably like you know, I'd probably take a $2,500 a month higher payment and, you know, a couple extra hundred dollars to cash to close. So it's helping them use tools like Mortgage Coach to sell now their value and, and help their client figure out, you know, how they're going to pay the commission. If we have everybody just out there saying, you know, I'll just accept the commission, um, that's on the that's on the listing, then we're going to have a problem because a lot of our agents are going to start getting lower and lower commissions, right? And it looks like we had a question that come, came through that says, is the 3% column correct? I would anticipate the purchase price to be higher on the 3% added to the purchase price. Um, it's not 3% added. That's just a 3% commission of mm -hmm. like, let's, so the, the, the idea, and maybe I could tweak this. Um, the idea is that there's a 3% commission already offered. Right. It's just flip flopped over what, over what you're thinking, not adding. Yeah. 3%, getting 3 yeah, yeah. So this is, this is, this is, if I go in, I have an agreement for my, with my buyer that they're going to pay me 3% and there's a 3%, you know, commission offered on the, on the first column second column it's two and a half percent so you'll just see as you go from left to right you'll see that um the commission is dropped so you had to add that on to the sales price so think right. about this everyone i mean this is a really big conversation now it's not a new conversation right it's a couple of months old but <clears> what i still see when i'm talking to realtors and other loan officers they don't really understand the implications of this right so it's interesting greg that your mls requires it you know talking to uh, lender realtors here. I've seen people anywhere from I'm required now by my brokerage to other people saying, I'm never going to do that because I have such great relationship with my clients. And, you know, someone might say they're open themselves up to, to liability and it, it's going to be a super fascinating conversation. So if y'all aren't familiar with it, just, you know, Google it a couple of times and read it. There's still, everyone has settled in the biggest suit that's out there, except for the NAR and Berkshire Hathaway. Um, kind of interesting. They've left the people with the deepest pockets um, still in, right. in, the, in the lawsuit. Again, something else you might want to understand. Um, and it's it's really getting the noise out of the way. I think uh, I was on a with a um, little mastermind and someone said, I don't know why someone would settle. And I think they're settling just to get it off the plates of their agents and, and having that. So I, I love that you're doing that. Do 
are are agents um, understanding and receptive to what you're showing them, Greg? Because it seems to me to be a different way to approach a conversation that others are struggling with. Yeah, for sure. Because I think if you if you're an agent and you don't think about the possibilities of you know adjusting the loan or adjusting the sales price, then you're thinking how how is my buyer? You know, if there's a two percent commission offered and I'm going to get 3%, how's my buyer going to come up with an extra $7,000? This is a first time buyer. They don't have that money. Right. And I promise you that there's probably not a lot of these kind of conversations or these, you know, graphical representations of the options that they have being used right now. Hopefully everybody that's on this call will start using this because it's going to help your real estate partners. And when you help them and when you can show them how to do their job better, at least it's been my experience, it always comes back. Well, and it kind of goes back to the the famous lines of Dave Savage, where he talks about speed to need, not just mm -hmm. speed to lead. And instead of making this focus on the need of the end user or the consumer, it's what are getting really deep with your agents to know what are their needs. And this is a huge one right now. Again, it may not be new, but I don't think there's a lot of loan officers talking about ways that they can help solve this challenge for their real estate partners. So um, that would be my, my challenge to all of you who are listening is of your you know top partners or those that you're courting, how aware are you on their top needs for their business this year? Like what are the things that they're trying to accomplish and what's getting in the way of those accomplishments beyond just leads? And I know there's agents that will say, you got any leads? <laughs> um, yeah. But other than that, you know, how are we doing a better job anticipating those needs and then being that source of value for them? So great job, Greg. I love that. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that's really important for people to understand is we talked about this a little bit earlier, how the market's going to be volatile. The market is going to change. The market is going to change a lot. And we have, you know, <laughs> we have people out there and they're fishing with a gun and we have people that are hunting with a fishing pole right now. And I, I'm sorry that if you haven't, you know, been paying attention and you don't know that maybe the two one buy down, uh, while that's a great strategy, it's not going to work if you have three other offers on the home, right? You're probably not going to get that accepted. So you might not want to lead with that. And if you are going in and you're bidding way over ask, your client's bidding way over ask, if you're not having the conversation with not only the agent, but the client as well, that, hey, uh, low appraisal is a real thing, right? If you go back in our market, if you go back to October, we were seeing price reductions when rates were 8%. So if a home started at 800 and it got reduced down to say 750, but now there's multiple offers on that house and it goes up to 825, let's say. So it goes over its original ask price. An appraiser can have a hard time justifying 825 when the market a, a month prior said that house was only worth 750 and not even that because it didn't sell at that, right? So you're going to have low appraisals. If you don't talk about it, if you don't say to people in the scenario where they're bidding over, especially that a low appraisal is a real possibility, then you're going to be caught with your pants down, right? And you're not going to have a solution for it. Well, we've talked about this for years in the mortgage coach community of the low appraisal gap strategy, right? And so, you know, we're using that again. So go back, use the use the right tool for the right job. You're going to need it. Very true. Do you have one of those by chance that for those maybe I, who who haven't I, seen the appraisal gap strategy, I do. do you have? I okay, do. Good. Yay. Always. I always have something in there. Come on. I mean, we we got to show some PCAs, I love the idea right? of what's, what's old is new again, right? You know, the two right? one we hadn't seen it for a decade. Appraisal gap we haven't seen for a couple of years. It's coming back. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just coming back. And you might, you know what the cool thing is, is like I said, you might need a fishing pole and a, and a gun. So, you know, this is our fishing pole and then our gun is our two, one strategy, two, one buy down strategies. So you might still be able to use them both even in the same week. It just depends on the buyer, depends on where they're buying. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is an oldie bit of goodie. Um, the, so the first column we have here is appraisal at sales price. So no problems, right? Appraisal's totally fine in this scenario. 
Um, you can see this, I, I did not redo this one. So you'll still see the rates 5.99. And I think the last time I did this was maybe a year or so ago. Um, so this one, 750, uh, putting 20% down, came in totally fine. 5% low, we just showed what you can do. So you can finance the mortgage insurance premium. Like everybody should know that. Um, and so what you see, the difference in the payment is pretty minimal in that scenario. If you're financing the mortgage insurance premium, you can see their cash to close stays the same. Obviously people, I always give people choices. Hey, if you were putting 20% down originally and you weren't gonna have mortgage insurance and now you are, cause the appraisal came in low, we have three different options. You can pay it monthly, you can roll it into the loan or you can buy out of it. It's totally up to you. But I, I just look at it and say, you know, what's what's going to be the best scenario for you? And I lay that out on a TCA as well. So everything I'm saying, everything I'm talking about, I put onto a TCA so that people can see it while I'm talking about it, right? I think that's really, really important. Uh, it takes a little extra time, but it's not that much time. We've talked about that before. It doesn't take as much time as people think. So then you just keep going. If the appraisal comes in 10% low, 15% low, it's the same concept. So nothing new there, but we're using it. Is there any, are you having to reteach that at all to the agents in your market center? Or do you feel like they all pretty much get it by now? Yeah. Agents, <laughs> I mean, agents aren't doing our job, right? So they're not, they're not dealing with the numbers and the the different strategies and what's possible with the different loan types and all that. They're not dealing with that like we are. So we can say, I, I made this mistake early on in my career where I would talk about something in front of a group of realtors and then they would come to me a month later and ask me if, if we offer this program. And I'm like, I just talked to you about that last month. My mistake, right? That's not their, their thing. It, they'll remember what I said for maybe a, a week or maybe a day. And then I have to keep reminding them that, hey, we have solutions for your problems. So the way I teach this stuff now is I don't teach the solution as much as I teach the problem, right? So okay. let me explain that. Yeah. I'm teaching, I, I'm, yep, I'm teaching a class right now on all the solutions we have to help people buy before they sell, okay? As the market picks up, contingent offers go away. That's not a thing anymore, in our market at least. So if you have somebody who is saying that they can't move because they have to be contingent, well, that costs a real estate agent two transactions. And in our market, where the median home price is almost a million dollars in our county, um, like, you know, that that that's a lot of commission that's just sitting on the table. So if you could get that person moved from here to there, that's one. And then you get to list their home too, right? So I'm teaching about the problem and then I'm creating solutions for that and showing them the solutions. But throughout the, throughout the class, I just keep leaning on the problem. And just saying, look at these solutions. We have lots of solutions for this problem. They're not going to remember all of the specifics of a specific program I talked about. They're not going to remember that. They're just going to remember, oh, I took this class and Greg has a lot of solutions for my problem when I run into a client who thinks that they can't buy before they sell. Wow. I love that. I know some um, of you are thinking, wow, my average price isn't a million dollars. I know, um, no kidding. <laughs> but, I, but if you think about it, all this applies, right? I mean, again, you have to reframe it and put it into your own your own world. And I, I think, you know, when going back to your piece where the realtors don't remember this stuff, right? We have the curse of knowledge because we do this every day. Keep in mind that the average realtor is only doing a handful of <clears throat> transactions a year. So they don't think about it till then and then they're, then they're stuck. And so right. that's the whole reason why you're keeping in touch with them. And just remember that I caught myself the other day using the word obviously. And I was like, wait, I'm sorry, it's not obvious. Yeah. And so also about, you know, the words that you're using and how you're making people feel on it because you're so smart and they're not familiar with it. Mm, very true. Yeah. And I wouldn't even say, I think sometimes like we, we've all done it where we we're kind of like, well, how can we know this stuff and somebody else doesn't? You know, it's, it, it's just, that's just, this is our job. And 
I might do more transactions than another LO. So I might have, you know, I always say you learn by banging your head against the wall, right? So I may have banged my head against the wall just more times than another LO. So I happen to know some guideline that they don't know, right? Um, it's, it's, we're just out here just learning and we need to try to teach other people what we know, not only realtors, but our up and coming LOs, because there's a lot of LOs right now that are, uh, you know, they may be got in the business in 2019 or something like that. And they're thinking this mortgage thing is awesome. Look at all this money I get. Now I get to drive a, a Ferrari or whatever you're driving and this is going to happen forever. Right. And now they closed five loans last year. So. Well, that is one. Problem. I, I kind of wanted to pivot to that because I know, you know, you run a branch and you have LOs, you know, you're, I call it the shit sandwich when you're the producing branch manager, like that's just a difficult job you're producing <laughs> and you're managing loan officers. So what are you doing to help them get trained for using these tools like mortgage coach and be, being able to position yourself as the expert when meeting with partners and working on scripting and, you know, your confidence in these meetings. Is there, do you have any secret sauces to help with getting yeah. people to do or adoption? What do you have? Well, I, I will tell you, I was in the core training for about six years. Um, I gravitate towards the coaching style of, um, I want to hear from people who are doing what I'm doing. And typically doing what I'm doing better than I am, right? So I am I'm the top producing, you know, low LO in my branch. So not only am I the lead, their leader and and their manager, but I'm also somebody who's who's walking the talk, right? So if I go out and visit open houses on a Saturday and a Sunday, then it's kind of hard for them to say, well, you know, I don't have enough business. And, and then I just say, okay, well, have you tried going to the open houses? Have you tried using some of the, the tactics that we talk about that I'm doing myself, right? So I think personally, I think that makes it easier for me to do my job because they can see what I'm doing. They know that I have high expectations of my own business and myself so then like a lot of times they'll call me on the weekend and they'll go, Hey, I went to this open house and I had, you know, I talked to three different people or whatever, like they're excited for that. And, and I don't really even have to coach them per se, other than just what I'm doing. Right. So mortgage coach is a, is really a non-negotiable in our office. Um, you know, if people don't use it, and then they come and ask me for a PE, <laughs> they're going to, they're going to hear it. Cause I'm going to say like, okay, what did you, what kind of options did we talk about on our, on our TCA? Right. Um, Cause I just believe that if you're sliding a, a one sheet over to somebody, then you're just asking for them to shop. You know, if you use a TCA with three or four different strategies, you're allowing the client to shop at your store. Hmm. So let You're me giving let me throw them those options. On that. Yeah, let me yeah. throw something in there. I was, I was talking to a broker from California who does a lot of business yesterday. And I asked him, does your loan officer use mortgage coach? And he said, no. And I said, do you, does your loan officer have good conversion with your leads? And he said, ah, now that you mention it, no. Um, and if you think about it this way, right, the consumer has a number in mind and mm -hmm. it may be accurate or we think more likely it's probably not inaccurate. You know, it's inaccurate. It's whatever they, they think they heard at the water cooler, they heard on the news. Um, and, and what they're hearing is rate, but they're not hearing the fee side of it. And so when you're putting mm -hmm. together three or four scenarios that are broad, right, low rate with high fee, high rate with low fee and everything in between, you're probably yep. going to catch their expectation in there and they're good to go. When you're sending one fee sheet to them, you're taking a guess, which is based on your experience as a loan officer. Most loan officers mm -hmm. think zero points. Most consumers think a particular rate and they don't right. care about that. It's now, yeah, you're going to go, Todd, there's people who shot me and care about these things. Absolutely. I was telling you, cast a wider net. Um, and so that's really the, the key. And then Dave will always say there's less tension in a transaction mm -hmm. um, when you don't have to have a, a client shopping or price exceptions. And if you look at the white papers out there, mortgage coach has gone into companies and studied it. And the loan officers who are 
uh, using Mortgage Coach compared to the rest of the loan officers of the company always have at least a 10 basis point lower price exception. But most of the time, at least in the ones I've read, it's been 30, 40. And then there's an outlier of over 60 basis points better in pricing. So sure. I think it's super easy if you're a leader to do what Greg's doing and require it. I think if you're a, a an LO, you're just making your job harder. Um, and yeah. there's so much free training on the Mortgage Coach site that you can become an expert pretty quickly. You just need to do 10 TCAs pretty quick. Um, and you can call friends and practice on them. So that's my Dave Savage isn't here. So I'm going to give the pitch. But that's really from my perspective as someone who's originated for a long time and leads a team and, and lives that same life that you're all living. Yeah, I, I think it's super, super important, though. You mentioned something. We have to remove our own bias. OK, so I I have a financial background. So for years, I would not give anybody, uh, you know, anything more than maybe one point. OK, well, I've changed that now because some of our competition is quoting two to three points with rates where they're at. I saw one the other day where, you know, the rate was like five and a half or something. I'm like, how many points is that? Right. And, and it was a lot of points. But that client at least looked at that and said, well, their rates five and a half. Right. So. You know, I think we need to at least, like you're saying, show them everything and then walk them back of why maybe you don't pay three points to get five and a half right now, right? You have to at least show it. So I agree with that. We have too much bias sometimes. So Todd, can I put you in the hot seat real quick? Oh, always, Deborah. always. <laughs> so because you're an exactly what to say certified guide, and we've learned about the three options you know, scripting, could you show the people who, or can we do a quick example doing the, let's say you're going to a restaurant and you're going to order off a menu and you have three options between steak, something that's a vegetarian plate, like a salad or seafood. Will you give a, a quick demonstration of how that works from the Phil and Jones? Oh way yeah, or you would be so much better at this <laughs> than me, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to jump in and, and, uh, and so what what do uh, what does the audience want me to what am I trying to talk people into? What's the one I really want? Let's say you are trying to convince me, which this would be a hard sell to go with the salad. Oh, I was gonna say you're going vegan. All right, I figured that. You know, and so the funny <laughs> part is when I say it, it's always Phil always does this, right? The way I see it, you have three options. So I always laugh because you know, I one of my scripts was, you know, we don't have a, a flag up front that says guarantee, you know, red flag at waves says we have the guaranteed lowest rates, and I'd always wave my hand. So whenever I do Phil's script, I always I always do that. Um, you know, Deborah, hey, I'm so glad that you came, that you asked about the, the specials today. Um, the way I see it is you have three options. You know, one is we have the steak and the steak, you know, what steak is always good. And you can get a steak like ours pretty much probably at any restaurant that you've been to, um, but it's not a bad choice. Um, you know, I also have the second option, which is the chicken. And, you know, I don't know if you're a bit like me, chicken is home and is really my favorite choice. I, I can't believe I'm actually recommending to you um, the salad, um, the vegan option. However, I went back in the back and I and I smelled it today. I saw it. Um, I tasted it. Um, it had the freshest greens that the chef picked from his personal garden, um, along with some vegetables um, that he got from his neighbor who has a heirloom tomato farm. Um, along with this dressing that he made with all these unique organic ingredients, including some spices he flew back last week from India. Um, which would you prefer? I mean, I, I think I'm going with the salad. How could you not? I don't yeah. want something that tastes <laughs> like rubber. Rubber chicken. <laughs> yeah. uh, so will you break down kind of what you did there? And, and for those of you who don't know, we we run uh, exactly what to say, personal certification, where we've become guides with Phil Jones and we have um, a, a mortgage edition and we're actually doing it in California uh, in May. Shocking. I think it's May 21st and 22nd. So just for the psychology breakdown of showing those three options and, you know, to put that final bow on Greg talking about the TCA and giving options, what did you do with the first, second and third to kind of get people to choose the option you wanted? I mean, ultimately, you know, you all heard it, right? What, what you're doing is, is you're, you want to always, give options. I mean, Greg talked about bias and, and I oftentimes ask a server, what is, what's your favorite? And they give me one choice. And oftentimes that one choice they give me is something I'm not going to eat. Like they might say, you should get the mushroom burger. Well, I don't like mushrooms. And they didn't know that. 
Um, and so ultimately what you're doing is by giving them options um, and making the first one sound okay, um, but not terrible. Um, you make the middle one sound terrible because that's the option you don't want them to take. And then you're really going to try to add um, you know, the extra sauce, so to speak, onto that final one of all the reasons why they would choose it, because that's the option that you want them to take. Now, we know in loans, when they choose a different option, it doesn't really matter because you're going to get paid the same on all of those options. However, it's a good strategy to use when you're trying to convince them to use the option that you know is the financially um, best for their scenario. Meaning someone who says, hey, you know, they do the you know, you're trying to get them a low cost loan now because you know you're going to be able to refi them later. And so there's there's going to be some some easy options to use it. But I think there's other times where you're going to let the TCA do the talking and, and give them the pros and cons to each scenario and then let them choose based on their long and short term financial and investment um, uh, strategies. Well, you killed it. Totally good agree. job. Yeah, that was good. In the hot seat. Have you heard that before, Greg? Or have you? Oh, read yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I do, you know, every day is I'm giving people all those, those options and I'm leading them mm -hmm. to where, where I think that they should go. And sometimes they say, nope, I want to pay two points. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, my tagline is I want to educate you so you can make the best decision for you and your family. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that that's something that, I've learned over time, you know, is not to be so like biased and indignant about you can't pay points or whatever, right? That that's their decision. That's what is best for them and their family. Yeah, I think it's key, right? Sales 101 is to help them make the best choice, right? And I, I say that's the last thing I would say on the TCA piece is that when a client chooses that number, whether it's the two points that Greg wouldn't have wouldn't have done or you wouldn't have done but they're happy with it. They're going to think that you're a better loan officer because you allowed them to make their choice. And I think that was kind of the light bulb for me because I was totally a no point guy, no fee refinance guy. And then I realized the first time I said, well, this is what I would do. Like that other thing, I probably didn't use the word stupid, but I probably implied it was. And the person's like, well, that's what I want to do. And you, you potentially lose a loan over that. So mm -hmm. I think it's really great advice for sure today, Greg. Okay, so we're in the last few minutes. Greg, is there anything else that we didn't hit on that you really want to leave people with today? Yeah, I, I think um, I just because we got the Super Bowl this weekend, I want to use this analogy. You have 32 teams in the NFL. If you all of a sudden cut those teams down to 16, and there was only 16 teams that got to use all of the talent that's in the NFL, how amazing would those teams be? They would be a lot better, right? With all those players. Well, that's what's happened in our industry is we took half the players and they're now, they're no longer in our industry. So it's no longer good enough to be the guy that answers his phone or the girl that uses mortgage coach. You have to lead people. You're going to have to be an A player if you want to win deals in this market because now you're going against all stars. And that's just the way it's going to be for a while. You know, I'm sure when rates dip enough, some of those people will come back. But for right now, you, you need to sharpen your sword. You need to, you know, be learning, watching the trust engine videos. Dave puts out a video. It seems like almost every day I watch them like y y twice a day. Like you can, you can learn from amazing people. You know, I just feel lucky to be, be included in that group, but like you can learn from Jeremy Forcier or Brian Hale, the one I watched yesterday or, you know, uh, Sean Guerrero from Denise Donahue. And then these guys are amazing too, right? So like, there's so much content out there. It's free. And I promise you, if you watch any of these videos, you will take away two or three things that you can implement today that will make you a better loan officer. Love it. Love it. All right, Deborah, I'm going to say something. I'm let you close us out for a change with, with the, with the coaching tips. First off, um, Don just threw in there a discount code for anyone who um, hasn't committed yet to head out to Vegas for Momentum Builder in a couple of weeks. I think it's going to be um, an amazing event. If you feel like you need to be somewhere for a couple of days where you can dig in with um, some of the brightest minds from the stage and some brightest minds sitting in the audience around you, it's a great opportunity. 
And um, the reason I'm letting Deborah give you the coaching tips is what I love about Deborah is she's a student of the game more so than anyone I know. Uh, because I got on this call, we always get on, a, you know, 10 minutes early and she's like, have you watched this interview or that interview? And I'm like, yeah, no, I haven't. And she's watched them all. So when Deborah gets on here, she is the one who has the knowledge of that we all want, all of us put together because she's paid attention, takes notes. And that's the advice that she's giving out in her social media and the tips that she's given to her crew. So um, I can't say enough about her and what she does. I want to thank you, Greg, before I go off. It's good to see you again. Um, and then Deborah, like you close it out. You got this. Well, I feel like we've got to close it out the same way we started and, you know, back to staying alive. And so if you are the few that have made it and, you know, we've we've had half of the the team leave, then you guys, you know what? Celebrate. Sometimes you got to celebrate the small win. Mm -hmm. So hopefully this song stays in your head all day. Thanks to Greg, because when we first got on, he talked about, hey, I'm staying alive. And so uh, 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 staying alive. Staying alive. All right, there you have it. Cuba <laughs> City's breaking people. and everything is quaking. Is that the words? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Staying alive. Stay It'll be in my head all day. All right, I love, love it. it. Uh, on behalf of Dave and the crew at Trust Engine, Plug and Play SM, Win by Noon, Greg, thank you so much for being here. We're super grateful for all of you for tuning in and watching. We look forward to seeing you guys next week here in the community.